Welcome everybody to the April 3rd meeting of the Burlingame City Council. Don't forget, is this, yeah. <laughs> this is where I have to talk into the microphone, do I? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so welcome to the uh, April 3rd meeting of the Burlingame City Council. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and I call the meeting to order at 7 p.m. And uh, as always, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'd like to ask a, an old friend of this council and a leader in the community, John Cabranian, to lead us to the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the religious stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and Thank you very much. Mr. Kavranian, and for everything you do to keep our community informed and keep council on its toes. We appreciate it. Uh, that takes us to roll call, Madam City Clerk. Council Member Stevenson? Here. Council Member Ortiz? Here. Council Member Beach? Here. Vice Mayor Colson? Here. Mayor Brownrigg? Here. All present and accounted for. Uh, there was no closed session, so there is no report out from closed session. That takes us to upcoming events, and I have several, and I think maybe one or two from my colleagues as well, but let me just quickly uh, go over. Uh, so uh, I don't see any teenagers in the room, but if but there are no doubt parents of teenagers, and our um, dedicated park and rec staff would like to know more about what would interest teens in terms of the programs that we run through the community center. And um, so there is a meeting for teens on April 12th at 5 p.m. to get your input on what programming you'd like to see. Uh, so please, please attend and have your voice heard. On um, April 20th, the Youth Advisory Committee, YAC, is running an anti-hate movie night from six to eight at the community center. And so please come along and love the movie and hate hate. Um, that would be that'd be great. Um, and then finally, uh, our beautification commission is going to be having a review of our urban treescape and how it fared through the storm on April 6th at 6.30 p.m. in the community, community center. And that is possible to join virtually, we hope, um, technology cooperating. Uh, I will say that as somebody who uh, helped moderate uh, a briefing on trees that was organized by the Burlingame Neighborhood Network uh, are not any great surprise, but our staff does a fantastic job of explaining what we've been going through, how hard we've been working, the, the ins and outs of assessing a tree, and um, when they have to go and when they can stay. Uh, so it's a super interesting presentation if you have a chance to, to hear it, and you can ask questions too if you like. Um, April is, which I did not know, is National Poetry Month, according to our crack librarian. Um, and for the month of April, if you have, if what, if your children are in elementary school, you may come to our library and get a book of poetry, and that is just a wonderful thing. So thank you very much. For oh, you have to bring a poem. Ah, there's a price of admission. Ah, mm. got it. Well, so be it. Um, limericks count, do they? I could. <laughs> Anyway, uh, do do come and get a book of poetry and write a poem. Um, that would be, and we'll maybe we'll even read out the best poems at the end of the month. Um, and then finally, on a, on May twelfth, so a little bit in the future, uh, our library will be announcing um, a Burlingame Hillsboro Youth Poet Laureate, which is super exciting. And I did wonder, Mr. Librarian, if you would like to join us and just explain how a young person would participate or, or, or compete for this honor, because that wasn't in my message. Hi, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, the competition is over, actually. 31st was the end of that process. And it's been, it had been a, it's a kind of an ongoing process. The current, uh, you, you've met her, I'm yes, on her, uh, Eva Chin. At the anti-hate thing. She was at the anti and she's and she's actually, when we were still online, she she recited a poem for council one time, um, because she had kind of aged out. She was she wasn't eligible to be our poet laureate, so she was, what was she, our poet in residence. I think was her title. That, you know, so she's been she's been holding classes, and 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 people from the classes are the ones that were applying 
And so the 31st was the cutoff, and now they're going to go into the judging process. Got it. So it takes five or six weeks to right. figure it but out. But then, like I said in, in my email to you, it's it's then then you have options of using the poet laureate for different events and I think it's I think it's fantastic and and if I may just since you're here I'd love to invite our poet in residence or or Ms. Chen um, um, to perhaps present a poem to us at the next council meeting in honor of National Poetry Month if she has the great would you extend the invitation to see if she'd like to join us love to love to be great thank you so much sure Colleen. Uh, so that's my list. Um, I know the vice mayor has um, an item as well, so I'll hand it over to her. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, on Monday, um, April 10th and Tuesday, April 11th, um, next door at Green Hills Country Club, the Silicon Valley Collegiate Showcase, which is the first, one of the first ever women's golf tournaments, um, which is you know just amazing to have 45 of the top women golfers that will be playing Monday and Tuesday at Green Hills Country Club in Millbrae. Um, it's important to Burlingame because they're also staying in Burlingame hotels. So I appreciate that this um, event draws to both our communities. And um, some of the local schools that will be featured will be Santa Clara, Stanford, and San Francisco State. Stanford is ranked, I believe, number one or number two. So they're some of the top women golfers um, in, in the world at this point. Um, so tickets are free. You just get online um, at SiliconValleyShowcase.com. You can go online. You can um, get tickets for free. And even if you can just meander over for an hour or two just to watch the, the young women, it, it's a really tremendous event. And um, um, interestingly, the partner on the man, men's version of this is Top Golf. So I'm hoping um, they do it at Paso Tiempo at another Alistair McKenzie course. So I'm hoping maybe someday they'll, you know, when they come to Burlingame, we'll have a way to tie this all in together and offer a woman's version. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing. Are there other events coming up for the community's interest? Um, for me, so. All right. Well, thank you all for that. Um, so then we're on to presentations of which there is none. Um, that brings us to public comments. So this is the chance for anybody uh, in the hall or online to share comments with us um, that are not on the that are on topics not on the agenda. And so I'm looking around the audience. Do I see any interest in public comments? I see none. How about online? Uh, we received one email. And it's from Donald, and he says the journal article was the first time that I had heard of this, which I believe refers to the bike lanes on California Drive. I know I don't go or follow the working of the city's plans on a regular basis, but you say that there was a reach out to city residents. I talked to my neighbors on Crescent and LA and not one knew of the project. Taking away lanes of traffic and putting in a bike lane seemed to me at least to be money not well spent. I talked to my auto mechanic and he was totally in the dark about this new bike lane. He says that there is no way that he can run his shop with the lane in place and the parking being removed. Just putting my thoughts on this, maybe do a business by business survey to make sure that this is going to work for them and their customers. Um, in addition, we have three people on line and no hands raised. Thank you for sharing those comments because that's not an agendized item. We can't react to it, but we have received input on that project and there have been letters going back out to interested parties. So um, if you write to us, we can also send you the same letter that explains things. Um, so uh, with that, then we move on rapidly to the consent calendar on which there are five items. Would anybody on council like to pull any of these items for further review? Okay, I see none. Where Does anybody in the public want to? Um, I have no emails and no hands raised. Perfect. Uh, in which case then I would entertain a motion to approve. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve items on consent, items A through E, 8A through E. Second. A motion by Council Member Beach, seconded by Council Member Ortiz. If we can do roll call. Council Member Stevenson? Yes. Council Member Ortiz? Aye. Council Member Beach? Yes. Vice Mayor Colson? Yes. Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. 
And with that adoption, I just want to thank Mr. Cabranian again. One of the items was a ban on smoking in the Broadway Business Improvement District, a very exciting experiment and a healthy one. So thank you. Uh, that takes us to public hearings. And again, there is none. Um, and so now we're on to staff reports. And the first of which is a, a resolution to uh, approve the installation of a public art sculpture. And I will turn that over to our city manager who will rapidly hand it over. Turn it right over to our library director. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Brad show tonight. Uh, hi, Marin Council. Uh, we have a PowerPoint slide here to just to pull up real quick so you can see can, what, what, they, what I'm talking they, about. Could, I'm sorry, could we just pause for a second? Sure. So most of us don't have screens that work. And we can't see that. Can I turn this around? Thank you, thank you, Mr. McCauley. Correct. Yep, that's great. Does the audience need to see that? So I'll give you a picture. Yeah. Oh. Margaret just asked if I put the, the measurements on there, and I didn't put the measurements on there. So uh, just a quick description. It looks like it's a small piece, but it's actually not. It's about the size of a medium-sized coffee table. So it's about this tall. That's big and tall. Sorry, about yay wide. <laughs> about this, this wide, about this tall. Um, it weighs close to a ton. Doesn't look like it would, Ow. but marble he is heavy. Um, it is Carrera Bardiglia. I have never heard the word Bardiglia before, but apparently the, uh, the quarry where it comes from in Italy was a quarry that Michelangelo has used before in the 1400s. So it's a, you know, come in a way it is a piece of Renaissance, you know, related to Renaissance art, um, as our, our globe trotting city clerk can tell us because she was just there. She may well even want to get up here and talk to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and it, <laughs> gonna get you for that. <laughs> yeah. um, Ray Lorenzato, the artist, uh, he worked in all kinds of mediums, not just sculpture. I think originally he did a lot of other mediums, painting, uh, all types of stuff. And this was done in 1983. Right around the, I think it was on his first trip to uh, Pietro Santo. Uh, he did a lot of trips every summer. He and his wife would go back and forth, back and forth, and they would, he would do all of sculptures and then bring them back, have them sent back. So uh, his family reached out to us sometime in February, and they were kind of on a really quick time frame, but has since it has since changed. But they were hoping to get all this done, including including approval by council. By April first, which we're we're kind of meeting their time frame, but things have changed. They're, they were trying to sell the family home, which all these sculptures are located at in San Mateo, and um, so they offered one to us. They were trying to sell some. Uh, Councilwoman Colson helped out by connecting them with Faloli, mm -hmm. and um, they're potentially going to do a. I'm not sure what you would call it. But what they're talking about, like a temporary storage uh, show. So it would be a show, but it would be temp a way to temporarily, temporarily store them and display them to the community until right. we can right. determine the future of them. Right, right. So, it was, you know, give them some exposure. And, uh, so we love this piece. Um, you know, it, it, I think it goes really well with the library's architecture, the Italianate architecture of the library. This piece in particular, I don't know why, but it, it reminded me of some sort of archaeological piece that was dug up, you know, uh, you know, outside of Rome, some Etruscan, whatever. Um, some of his stuff is a little more modern and, and the trustees and I didn't really, didn't see that, that as, a, as potential. Plus a lot of his other stuff was either really big or really small. This one we thought was a good size. We'd like to have it uh, over on the, uh, what side is that? West side of the building here going down Primrose um, between where the bike racks are and where the benches are that parks built for us in that, that, mm -hmm. that new landscaped area. There's a slightly mounded area right there that, um, that will have It'll need a it'll need a concrete footing as a base, 
Um, and, uh, and we'll have a plaque on the sidewalk there for people to see. So I think it's, you know, it's a win-win for all of us. Um, it'll cost a little money to get it ready because sit, sitting something like this outside has to be, there's some sort of a, epoxy coating that will have to have happen. Um, and the base will have to be built and the transportation and all that kind of good stuff. So the trustees will pick up the tab for that. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great presentation and initiative. Uh, questions for Mr. McCauley. On the plaque, um, is it just going to be the artist's name and the name of the piece, or will there be some other educational part of it, like maybe a QR code or something that they can go to and actually learn a little bit more about the piece? That's a really good question. The family, we talked about this, and the family just thought they they were they were just asking for artist's name, date, and a little bit about you know the the title of it, you know. The QR code is an interesting idea, but I'm just wondering though, like 20 years from now, is that QR code still going to be true? True. <laughs> and this is going to be like a you know a nice bronze plaque. So, but that's an interesting idea though. I have to think about that how we how we would educate to go along with it, M Madam Vice Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Well, there would always be the option to put together inside the library a QR code situation for all the art that we retain at the library. Yeah. So it would be a key to everything with um, maybe the depiction of where these pieces are throughout the library. Plus, um, you know, and that would be easy and fun. I think that's a really good idea, you know, creating some sort of map mm -hmm. because we do have, you now we have the owl, we will potentially have this piece. We do have the, um, What's the word I'm thinking? Not, not the banners. What are the um, oh, uh, tapestries? Tapestries. Thank you. You know, some of them. One of them is 16th century Flemish. I yeah, believe. Important. A couple of others are from 19th century. So we do have. You know, we've got the mural. Yeah. There's the mural. And and the Anson Berlin game bust is there. Right. Correct. So. so creating a nice little map that has all these things with the information on it. That's a great idea. Cool. Um, any other comments or questions? I, I just want to thank you. Um, this is the second piece of art that you helped install. And um, it is part of, I think, all of our um, interest to create more public art, more interest for people walking down the street, more reasons to be on the street, uh, and moments of unexpected joy or humor or or whatever. You know, it's um, it's what makes a special city. So thank you. I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I should have asked uh, Mr. McCauley, but probably there isn't. Are there any public questions uh, for Mr. McCauley? There are none. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got your hopes up. <laughs> All right. Well, that, I think, uh, let's see. We have a resolution. We need a resolution. Um, would anyone care to make the resolution? Mr. Stevenson. I make a resolution to approve. I don't. Acceptance of the artwork. Acceptance of the artwork. I'll second that. Motion by Council Member Stevenson, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Colson. If we could do the roll call. Council Member Stevenson? Yes. Council Member Ortiz? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Vice Mayor Colson? Yes. Mayor Brownrigg? Yes. All five. There you go. Okay, so that takes us to our second staff report item. And um, this might have been on consent. It is the straightforward acceptance of a contract often done on consent, but it gives us a chance to also get an update on the timing of the town square and ask other questions. So I will hand it off to uh, Mr. Gardner. Uh, thank you, Mayor Brownrigg and members of the council. Um, it is a privilege to discuss the town square with you this evening. And as mentioned, uh, there's actually kind of two pieces to this presentation. The first is the uh, agreement for the next phase of work, but also it's a great opportunity to bring the council and the community up to speed with the latest in the design development. Uh, next slide, please. So construction projects typically have four design phases, conceptual design, schematic design, design development, which we just finished, and then construction documents, construction documents where we really get into the details and every last decision uh, has to be made. Um, it's been great uh, to date with the design development. Um, we've had a really good collaboration among all the different city departments. We've been meeting about every three or four weeks, and um, it's at this point, I would say it's a joint project among um, 
parks, public works, and community development, each having their own interests and, and um, really good collaboration. Next, please. The site plan, this is from the design development phase. Uh, this will look very familiar. Um, and in fact, the design is not changing substantially from where the concept design was when, uh, when we last saw it. Um, so at this point, we're just starting to get into all the specification, make the decisions that have been put off until now of all, you know, all the materials, the plantings, all of that. Um, but uh, just to provide a refresher, it's, it's a sort of two part square with one part being a grand plaza um, with the terrace seatings leading up to the former post office and then uh, on the Lorton Avenue side is a grove, which has a, a lot of seating, um, both for kind of lounge seating as well as uh, tables for eating or picnicking and, and then also a water feature. Next, please. So we start getting into the details. This is the planting plan. Everything's too small to see here, but uh, just to say that all of the plants are being chosen. It's a, it's a nice variety very colorful, drought tolerant, um, appropriate to a downtown location. The trees will be London Plain, which are uh, those trees that we had in that initial outreach with the public that everybody really gravitated to. And, and these London Plain trees do really well um, in this urban environment. Next, please. And this just shows a detail showing um, there's a hedge that would go up against one of the questions was, what do we do with the blank wall against the building facing the square? So there'll be a really nice hedge. Um, and then uh, also the, the trees in front of that with the seating, so it's a, a composition, and then the same trees leading into the growth. Next, please, sir. I'd actually forgotten that. So it's actually a hedge planted in front of the wall. That's correct, yeah. Right. Thank you. This just shows the planting palette, um, and, and also these slides are on the city's website, so if anybody wants to drill down and look at specifically what plants are being proposed. All of these sheets are on there uh, on the Town Square page, which we'll show at the end of this presentation. Next. The lighting is, is a fun part that um, we've looked at, and uh, this is meant to be a great space, both daytime and nighttime, and also safe space. So um, it will be well lit, but also um, interestingly lit. There'll be up lighting of the trees. Uh, there'll be down lighting. There'll be string lights. Um, and things can change over the season or for special events. Next, please. One of the fun features is this uh, sort of figurative sure. creek, uh, which would go through the middle. And um, and that's complemented by the different lighting, whether it's string lights or, or up lights or all of the above. Next, please. And the technology is pretty simple, actually, which is good for the long term for maintenance. Um, these are merely uh, slides. It's kind of like some of the, the old toys, maybe some of us had years ago with uh, just a film and a slide and it goes around and it creates this great pattern on the ground. Um, the other thing that's nice, although we're showing water here, is it could have different patterns for different times of the year. There could be uh, falling leaves in the fall. There could be snowflakes, although it doesn't snow here. It's, you know, conceptual. So there's a lot that could be done with this. And, and again, it's, it's very simple technology. Next. Um, and then this is, it's a little hard to tell in this, but the, the water feature. Uh, so there's been a uh, real desire to have a water wall or water feature. We didn't want to have a full, full fledged fountain for various reasons. They're hard to maintain. They use a lot of water. Uh, so this is a water wall, which uses less water. Um, it's, it's a backdrop, but it creates a, a really nice setting for that grove. So as you're sitting there uh, dining or playing games or, or just uh, hanging about, um, there's this uh, sort of tranquil water in the background. Next, please. And also, it's a multi-use building. So as much as it's providing this water wall, um, which is the backdrop to the grove, it's also providing um, two restrooms. We decided uh, two is better than one. It's really um, needed in downtown. And then there's also the uh, machine room for the fountain, which uh, been pretty interesting just learning about how all of these work and the amount of equipment uh, involved to make sure the water is um, circulated properly and clean and safe. And then there's also some storage areas there for uh, maintaining the square itself. Next. Can you, 
question? Back Vice on. Mayor, yes. Yes. Um, so when we had met, we had talked about shifting the um, restroom component to the end and the mechanics closer to the other side in order to prevent having to have a door in the middle of the waterfall. Did that not work? That can still be done. So um, it wasn't shown in this set. Uh, it was an alternative and in construction defense, we can make that determination. We can make that call. But yeah, that would be another option, just moving the things around in that building and then the door into the restrooms to be around the, <coughs> from the um, Park Road side as opposed to the Lorton side. And then you get a nice clear um, uninterrupted water wall, right? And also, um, you know, recognizing uh, it's great when the water is there. Sometimes it may not be if there's servicing, if there's a drought, what have you. Uh, so the feature is also designed to look great even without the water. So that top image is a glassy, it's it's kind of a multifaceted glass uh, surface that uh, has, it uh, reflects the light and, and uh, would look really great. Uh, any time of day, even uh, even without the water, but even more so with the water. Uh, the next slide or the next photo down are the pavers. Um, these are going to be concrete pavers. They look, they have a stone-like finish, but they are more durable. Um, and that's really important for the long-term maintenance. Uh, I will say we've been spending a lot of time on those pavers, trying to get the mix just right. Um, and that's been in coordination with the um, development project next door at 220 Park Road. We want to order all of the pavers all at the same time so that um, they all match. So um, lots of work is going into getting the mix and how you finish it. I'm, I'm learning a whole lot about uh, <laughs> paving just as we've gone through this process. And also they're meant to match um, the bottom photo shows the finishes for the development project next door at the post office. Um, so that everything looks um, not matching so much, but compatible. Uh, there's some nice contrast, but um, also it, it, uh, it'll uh, look good all together with the building next door. Next, please. This is pretty hard to see, but it does show the, the kind of loungy seating. There are benches, but uh, you can sit on them as a bench. You can recline like a chaise lounge. Um, there's a lot of different options. Um, so it's really meant for informal gatherings. Next, please. And then these are some of the furnishings. So in addition to these benches, there's uh, picnic tables. And also uh, in the second photo are these adjustable chairs. Uh, the, the designers call them nudgeable, that you can just nudge them. They're, they weigh a lot, so you can't just pick it up and carry it away, but you can adjust it and, and uh, kind of make yourself comfortable. Also, planter boxes, uh, the sidewalk that goes along Park Road will be flush with the roadway. So um, in order to keep vehicles out of the square, there would be some planter boxes. But the idea is that then the roadway for special events could become an extension of the square. Next. And then some fun furnishings, um, foosball and uh, possibly a ping pong table and beanbag toss. Or These are all... Um, you wouldn't think you would find them in a park or a square, but these are all durable. They're designed to be outdoors. They are they're heavy duty equipment. Um, and then of course, trash containers, which are necessary, but also um, we want them to look good and, and match everything else. Next. So this shows a rendering of the square from the Lorton Avenue side. This is the grove. So you can see the grove of trees, the, the different seating underneath. Um, it's anticipated some time in the future because um, this is a long-term project of some of the buildings along the um, Burlingame Avenue side of the square may open up on the backs and, and start to create um, some interface on the square as well. Uh, so that's what this shows. Next. Uh, these are a lot of numbers that's in the staff report, but it's showing um, what is anticipated for the next phase, which is construction documents. This is where everything is put together in order to provide enough information for construction and also to solicit bids. So the consultant SWA would be uh, preparing the construction documents along with their subconsultants. They would also be advising in the bid phase as questions come up on requests for information and, and uh, other items um, that they'll be suited. Uh, the total dollar amount is $617,150. Um, there is another further phase 
which is not in this budget, but we did ask them. We wanted to know what's basically what are we in for here? What's our full extent of soft costs going all the way through construction? So they have also given us a quote for construction administration where they would uh, help oversee the project while it's being constructed. That'll most likely be in next year's budget, um, but that would be about $250,000. Please. And this dovetails with the 220 Park Road construction schedule. Um, this is a timeline that's provided to us by Dostart, the um, construction firm or the, the developer of that project. It's updated every month. So this is from March and you can see in the March up, uh, update, it mentions the second floor going up, which I think people have seen the third floor deck being installed. It shows site improvements in the first and second quarters of 2024. So that's what we're wanting to match. Um, as they get the shell of the building finished, they'll be doing the site improvements. And that's when the parking lot will start to be vacated and also be available for the city to start building the square. Next week. There's three, three different websites for the public to learn about. Um, the town square itself has a page at burlingame.org slash town square. If people are curious about the status of downtown construction um, and that uh, graph that we just saw on that last slide, that's at burlingame.org slash downtown construction. And then uh, if they're curious about the development project next door at the former post office site, it's burlingame.org slash 220 park. And that's the presentation and open for questions and uh, and also just the professional services agreement. Thank you very much. I know I have a couple, but let me first turn to colleagues. Comments or questions? Yes, Councilman yeah. Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, Director Gardner, I know a lot has gone into this project over the years and a lot of input from the community and the commission and everything. So that's great. Um, Obviously, the success of a town center will be that people use it, that they want to come there. It's a destination that, you know, much like a park is, you know, as well. So I'm, I'm curious about the utility of the space to allow different types of events, different, you know, there were renderings on some of the websites about food trucks, for, for example, and having those be able to pull in and have an event based on that. I know that's been part of the thinking. I would just love to hear more comments about what went into them. For sure, yeah. And and I'd say the, the most flexible part of the design is the side closer to Park Road, which is more of a plaza. Uh, it does have a broad paved area that would lend itself to market stalls, to um, possibly food trucks. Uh, it is being designed to uh, be able to be driven on. Um, that's also a necessity just because the we have to bring in the equipment a couple times a year to clean out the culvert there as well. So it's being engineered for um, all kinds of different uses. Uh, there's a, a couple of different areas where there could be a stage for live performances and they could be you know, even right across from the terrace steps. Uh, the terrace steps are also multifunctional. We didn't really discuss a lot of it uh, here in this presentation, but they're technically part of the development project and that's where the, the um, that project and the town square come together. Um, so parts of the parts are very multifunctional. Others are maybe a little more static, but even the area, uh, for example, the Grove, which has more fixed seating, also has a lot of options in terms of how people are going to use the space. Um, they can use it for, they could bring in a lunch from somewhere else. They can uh, play some of the games. Um, we've talked about maybe leaving that space in the middle, maybe taking out one tree and having that as, as something that could either be for art or for just some other purpose. So um, it is, it's trying to address a lot of the community's desires and, and create something that really works for the urban space. Thank you. Thank you for that. Council Member Beach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and great presentation. Could you just, for the sake of all of us and the sake of the public, just summarize sort of an estimated timeline at this point for when construction might actually begin or maybe even finish on the town square? With every construction project, you have to be careful about timelines. But um, so I could say- But everybody's asking us to. Yeah, we're looking at <laughs> early 2024. That's when we, uh, that's when the developers are telling us they'll be clearing out of the parking lot. 
And then the question comes down to how long does it take to construct the square? So if we started construction in uh, spring of next year, uh, maybe about a year from now, uh, anywhere nine to 12 months, uh, that's where I get a little less construction. <laughs> construction uh, projects can fall behind based on materials and all kinds of things, but um, it would be great. Uh, again, this is an aspiration, not a promise, but uh, if it was ready in time for the holidays of 2024. Thanks. And there, there is the hope that we will be able to encourage uh, the, the builders to vacate even, well, as soon as possible. There was a, at first a request to be able to continue to use it as staging and we said, mm, not so much. So we'll see when we can get started. Yeah, we, we've conveyed that to them. I will say uh, Doe Start has, really great in the coordination of this, particularly, you know, right down to the paving has been a, a massive coordination, uh, you wouldn't think, but it is. And uh, so they've, I think they understand the city's objectives. They've, you know, they, they, uh, they try to weigh what's, what is imperative for their development project versus what the city uh, needs. But um, I think they're, uh, they're um, acting in good faith good part. of trying to make it work. Yeah, for sure. Are there comments or questions? Yes, Vice Mayor Coulson. And can you um, talk a little bit about just the overall cost for the square and where we're maybe how that money's coming together? You know. So we will be doing a cost estimating as part of the construction documents. And um, I'll say the costs, they hit a kind of high point a few months ago. We're hoping that they're coming down a little bit. So we're not throwing numbers out yet, but I see Lisa is about to mention it, probably in what fact, we already have in the bank. Thing. Um, so the total cost, I don't know, that's that's for Kevin to figure out. Um, but for funding, we have $2 million from the developer. We have $1 million courtesy of then assembly member Kevin Mullen as part of the state budget. We have $750,000 um, from then Representative Jackie Spear as part of the federal appropriation last year. And I actually have a webinar on Wednesday to figure out how to access that money because they don't make it easy. And then last week, um, Director Mertuza and I actually met with Supervisor Pine's staff, uh, his chief of staff, Linda Woolen, and uh, we may be able to tap into $500,000 from the county for this project. So we have to um, submit some details, which I'll be working with Kevin on, um, but he has uh, helped various other cities and he wants to do a project in Burlingame now. So then it would be kind of that nice synergy of, you know, the feds, the state and the county all contributing to this project. So, and then whatever the leftover is, will either be fundraising or tapping into um, general fund dollars, or we have to figure that out. I think we have some also maybe public facilities impact fees. So we have to figure out where that um, remainder comes, but we need the final cost estimate as well. Thank you for that. And also I add, you know, public works has been turning over every stone to see where, Grant. what different funds can things come out of, whether it's stormwater impact fees, what have you. Um, so we'll want to present you with a kind of full financial picture before too long. And, uh, and that'll be part of its capital project. Well, and presumably the bid documents will elicit, you know, a much more granular understanding of cost. So, right. And I think we had a really good model on the community center as mm -hmm. to how the public wants to engage and be, you know, be involved. And that model might work over here as well. That's what we were hoping. <laughs> Any, one more, just a quick story about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just in terms of the, dependence between 220 Park and the town center. Is there anything that would prevent us from sticking with that timeline, even if that facility wasn't 100% stood up at that time? Or are, are they independent, essentially? Uh, it mainly comes down to if, you know, the, the site has to be prepared in such a way to to be ready for for everything. So if if there were construction complications with the development project that could put the town square behind. Um, so they are related. Um, they, they can kind of go in succession one after the other, but um, it's, it's uh, that's a big part of what we're gonna be discussing in the next phase is just how do we 
phase everything and are there corners that can be done or do we need to really prepare the whole site all at once and and, uh, and the only thing the only yes i would add to that is it was and then again dostart and saris were not opposed to this but the tenant improvements which happened inside the building mm -hmm. those are not dependent on the outside right so the outside gets done we can go to work and if something got delayed on a tenant improvement not our not our problem great okay. right mm -hmm. yeah well, particularly the yeah the timing of the tenant improvements may you know depends on are there tenants and and mm -hmm. uh, and and that it's it's all very variable. So there are still a number of variables, but um, we're we're working closely with them. And and um, like I said, it's it's been a very cooperative relationship, and and they understand the city's position on wanting to get the square. Um, it's also an asset for their project, so it uh, mm -hmm. it uh, works for everybody's purpose sure. to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, I had a, just a couple of small questions. One, if you go back to the top down slide, is that possible? The site plan? Back maybe two slides. Uh, keep going. There, or no, one more, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's where you see the whole thing. Uh, that, yeah, one more. I will need it. But, oh no! All right, go forward. <laughs> right. It's like so, Mike. This is the <laughs> this is about lights, and I also realize this is not our business. This is their business. But the green lawn behind those three trees on Park have they landscaped that yet? Do we know what that's going to be? Uh, it's interesting because the lawn is considered part of the historic setting of the post office. So okay. Um, I think their hands are tied a little bit on that in terms of uh, how it can be used. So what we've seen uh, most recently is it looks very lawn-like. I, I don't know if it will literally be this, you know, same kind of lawn that was there before, but um, it is meant to keep that same setting. And actually the same with the entrance to the former post office that also um, needs to be defined in a way that still uh, kind of keeps that formal setting that the post office had. So um, that's part of the whole historic, uh, mm -hmm. the facade, the lobby, all of that um, would. would uh... And then I ask only because I know we'll get asked, but um, the large benches that might attract overnight sleeping, what does the city do about that? There's different uh, ways to mitigate it. You know, certainly there's there are ways you can design the benches so they are not as hospitable to um, overnight sleeping. Um, there can also be uh, uh, so the park or or just uh, monitoring of the park. Um, it's pretty open, so um, it's there's not a lot of hiding places, anything like that. But um, yeah, we're thinking about it. We're yeah, for sure, yeah. And then um, finally, just to confirm the the um, the alleyway that we are using, uh, that's our land. That's not the property owner's land. So we don't need their permission. Although we've had a lot of cooperation, I know that, but we don't need their permission to implement this plan. Is that right? There, yeah, I'd say the the title of the land is it's looking like it's the city's but that's something we still have to kind of get squared away in the next phase make sure that uh the legal that paper. there aren't any surprises okay uh, there is definitely the interest to have it as part of the square um but this next phase too is where we get uh you know all of the agreements in place if they need to be there um, we know one of the other neighbors has offered to um, provide a place for uh, trash and recycling bins on their own property. And well, I, this I, is I the call um, that landowner out. I mean, actually, everybody has been, as far as I know, super collaborative. But that that landowner in particular has gone above and beyond to enable that design by taking uh, the public waste bins onto her property. Um, so we we are really grateful to her for doing that. Yeah, so they've uh, next phase we will want to make sure that 
this is where the rubber meets the road and we, uh, you know, things that were uh, offered are, are now memorialized. Yeah. Uh, we always have a, a plan B should something fall out. Um, there are ways to maintain the alley as it is and still create the right setting for the square. But um, as, as you mentioned, the neighbors have been um, really interested in this and, and really uh, approaching from a civic steward kind of perspective. So it's, uh, we've been really happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions from council, I, I'll entertain if there's anybody in the public who'd like to comment. Uh, yep, we have Jennifer Fast with her hand up. So please go ahead, Jennifer. Um, hi there, everybody. I um, I appreciate all of your questions. Um, they were pretty much the ones I wanted to ask in particular about um, potential entertainment areas there. Appreciate Councilman um, Stevens and asking about that. Um, so I guess I had somehow in my head envisioned that maybe um, an arrangement could be made potentially with the tenant of the um, post office um, as far as using that as sort of an automatic raised stage area eventually, but I realize that's way down the line, but I, in my head, I kind of had envisioned that as sort of a built in area, but it depends, I guess, on what they're using that, um, outdoor area for. So that was just my comment. And I did want to thank all of you, Kevin, and I'm sure Donna and Michael and anybody interested in the um, aesthetics, I real I know how taxing the choice of pavement pavers can be, and it's really difficult. And it it sounds as if you've really tried to sort of pull in the tiles and things from the post office into your palette. And um, I some people don't pay any attention to that, and I really, really, really appreciate all all that you've done and the council has done on this. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how it all turns out. So thanks, thank you very much for their work. Thank you for those comments. I don't. Was there a question in there? If no, uh, well, thank you very much, Ms. Fab, for for your comments. It's appreciated. Um, any other comments or questions? No, that's it. Okay. In that case, I'll. You know, it's, I have to say, being back up here in this hybrid, I don't have the hammer habit anymore. <laughs> I, I haven't been using a hammer at home, you know, so I'm, I'm out of the hammering habit. Thank goodness. Anyway, uh, we'll close uh, that uh, the hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Gardner, for that report. We're, we're all super excited. Um, okay, that takes us to council committee and activity. You actually have to do a motion. What? Adoption. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to make a, a resolution. Yes, I, I beg your pardon. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm very excited to uh, uh, make a motion to approve the resolution to uh, move this project forward. Thank you for that. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Very good. So, uh, Council Member Ortiz uh, makes a motion to move forward and seconded by Vice Mayor Colson. If we could have a roll call vote. Council Member Stevenson? Yes. Council Member Ortiz? Yes. Council Member Beach? Yes. Vice Mayor Colson? Yes. Mayor Brownray? Yes. And there you have it. Thank you very much um, to our crack team and to the SDWA folks who are helping us. That takes us on to Council Committee and Activities Reports. Do colleagues have anything that they'd like to share? I I see none. Uh, I think the only the only nice thing is to say that um, I know some of our staff could not be there, but we did. All of us were able to attend the Silicon Valley, um, or the Sustainable San Mateo County um, awards ceremony for the green building. And Margaret, to your staff, I want to say a great thank you because um, I, I think the accolades on it and the response from the community was um, overwhelming. People were incredibly impressed with it and really happy. And I know your staff did a lot of work on that. So thank you for working with us on the net zero energy and thank you for helping us get that award. And I think the city should be proud of it. Yeah, a hundred percent. There was a lot of competition too. So the yeah. city of Burlingame, um, you know, we do, we get to pat ourselves on the back a bit on that one and on staff's back. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that. Anything else? Um, Okay, thank you very much. Then that takes us to future agenda items. Are there uh, matters that 
council members would like to suggest for a future agenda. I see none. Um, in which case then that takes us to acknowledgements. Uh, there are minutes that we get and they're in our packet and online for the different commissions. And we thank all of the commissions for their hard work. Um, and so that is the acknowledgements. And then it takes us to adjournment. And I would like to adjourn in memory of somebody, but let me first ask colleagues if there's anybody else that they would like to close in honor of. In which case then, I would like us to um, have a few moments of silence for uh, John Clinton. Um, John was um, a longtime San Mateo resident um, who um, celebrated his religion here in Burlingame and elsewhere. Um, but what he was, um, from a public official's point of view, what he's most known for is being a newspaper man um, and being a really good one. and and. Uh, you know, today more than ever, local journalism is under attack and is um, one of the most important things to our democracy. And John recognized that. So he helped steer what was then the uh, San Mateo County Times um, for a number of years. He inherited it from his father, uh, took over, and was an amazing newspaper man. He was also um, a great wit, um, very funny to be around. I he somewhat predated me in terms of both the newspapers and public life, um, but I had the great joy of meeting him on some of these occasions, some of these lunches, um, always a twinkle in his eye, always thinking about other people. And I think that's something that his family has underscored to us as well, how much he was, he, you know, he'll be remembered in large part for his good sense of humor, but also really importantly for the good deeds that he did. And, and that's what makes him so uh, so much missed. Um, there will be, for anybody who'd like to attend and pay their respects, a funeral mass on April 13th at 10 a.m. at St. Catharines of Siena in Burlingame. Uh, and also, uh, if you care to make a donation in memory of Mr. Clinton and everything that he helped bring to this community uh, over many, many years, then um, please, uh, in lieu of flowers, please make a gift to the San Mateo County Historical Association or the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, Mr. Clinton will miss you. Um, please, a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned. I know. <laughs>